All right, welcome everyone to Open Education Week 2014 and to the third of our Community College Consortium OER Innovations panel. Um, so glad that you could uh, join us today and I, I notice a number of you have been at our earlier sessions too. Um, and um, I think that um, uh, they were very well received and um, we have two other um, amazing OER leaders who are going to speak with us uh, now. Um, and so first of all, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Donna Godet. Uh, she is the uh, math chair at Scottsdale Community College in Arizona and um, has been a longtime developer of, and a doctor of OER. And uh, Donna, do you want to say a few words? Sure. First of all, um, thank you all for being here and joining in the festivities this week for Open Ed Week. And I'm looking forward to um, talking to you about our project. And um, as I mentioned to um, Don, who had signed on kind of early, if there's anything you're interested in, follow up, um, using any of our stuff, I'm happy to communicate with you after. So don't hesitate to send me an email. Great. Thank you, Donna. Um, and secondly, we have Quill West, who is the OER Project Director at Tacoma Community College in Washington, who has been leading the Liberate Project for several years now. Um, prior to that, Quill was, the, uh, was a librarian on the Open Course Library, so she is a longtime uh, OER uh, leader as well. Quill, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, you did it fantastically well. Um, I also want to say that I am happy to share whatever anybody needs, so please feel free to contact me afterwards um, if, there, if I say something that you would like to follow up on. Wonderful. And Quill, if you can just speak up a tiny bit, that would be great. And, and I want to reiterate that Donna and Quill are probably two of the the two people who I go to first when I have a question I can't answer. So we've got, we've got some real experts on today. Um, and uh, since this is um, Open Education Week, I'm going to have a brief introduction to OER. And I thank you for some of you who've actually, this is the third webinar you're sitting through with me today. So I'll try to go through those slides briefly. And then uh, we're going to hear from Donna about Scott, Say Scott Sales OER math program, uh, which ranges from uh, their, their developmental math curriculum through their pre-calculus. And then uh, Quill is going to talk to us about Tacoma's uh, Liberate project, um, where I, I'm not keeping track of the numbers, but uh, they were originally were targeting, I think, $250,000 in two years. And, they exceeded that in uh, nine months of that project. And that was uh, nearly a year ago. So we're going to have, I'm sure we're going to hear much more about uh, what's happened about recently. And then finally, I, I'm going to close with just a few uh, slides about our community of practice and how you can participate um, if you would like. So very quickly, <laughs> what are open educational resources? So the U.S. Department of Education uh, gives us this definition, and it's very commonly used. It's teaching, learning, and research resources that are either in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use or repurposing by others. And in fact, the Department of Education and the Department of Labor um, and really the federal government recently has been very supportive of open access, uh, particularly with the community colleges. Um, the tax grants, which are uh, focused on community college uh, career training, um, has infused a lot of funding into producing OER for career, uh, career technical ed, essentially. Um, and some of you may be involved in that, um, those programs. Uh, so what is an open license? Um, an open license is a Creative Commons license um, that sits on top of copyright. You, as an author or someone else who is producing these materials retains their copyright, but they make available a version of the resource that can be reused, revised, remixed, and redistributed. So it's a very powerful mechanism for sharing. And um, in the, these 
uh, resources really can range from uh, very small resources to complete textbooks, complete courses, um, um, videos, uh, you know, such as the Khan Academy, which are usually five to ten minute videos that are openly licenses, even images that you might use in your PowerPoint. Those, those are all examples of, um, of, of OER. Um, but even more widely, we include tools, techniques um, that support ready access to knowledge. And the mission of the Community College Consortium for OER is to promote adoption of OER to enhance teaching and learning. And, and we focus a great deal on faculty um, and the benefits of OER for students, both in terms of affordability, but also um, often uh, this inspires students to collaborate and to take more ownership around um, their education. And I know um, Quill and Donna will speak somewhat to that. Um, a big part of our work here at um, CCCOER is professional development. And so we do webinars monthly uh, focused on uh, faculty development and helping faculty and deans and directors uh, find resources to bring back um, and be reused um, with, with students. And we are a voice for open education at community colleges. That's what we were founded, uh, founded through. Um, but we do, we do work with four-year colleges and universities as well. And often we have a speaker from a four-year college or university uh, along with our, our community college speakers um, because we work so closely in terms of moving students along into uh, the four years. And we have, um, this slide's actually a little old. We have 240 colleges in, I think, 17 states now. Uh, Pennsylvania and Delaware have just joined us. Uh, which we're just thrilled about. And um, we'd love to fill in the middle part of this as well. So um, <laughs> not that we're, we welcome anyone into the consortium, but uh, we need a little more in the middle. And now at this time, I want to turn it over to uh, Donna Godet to talk about her map. Super. Thanks, Una. And I'm going to talk about um, we are from the village approach, and this is the idea that um, to run a successful OER program that goes beyond an individual instructor, it really does take um, your whole department or your whole area uh, of interest that you're working with in your college. And I'll kind of explain how that works at Scottsdale. So um, our transition to open educational resources at Scottsdale started with some separate projects. We had folks that were developing, we didn't even know they were OERs. This was like five or six years ago. We didn't know there was a word for what we were doing. We were just creating materials that we wanted to use in our hybrid and our online classes. So there was a group that was doing that. And then we had um, faculty that were um, interested in using OER to facilitate their their classroom instruction, so they began to be interested in the materials we were, we were working with. We also started to create a lot of videos to support our work, and then we had a group that discovered uh, MathAS, which those of you math folks might know what that is, but that's an open source assessment tool that was actually created in Washington State by a faculty member named David Lipman. And so we kind of had these different initiatives going on. And then in the spring of 2012, one of our faculty members said, hey, I could pull all those together and I could offer a complete system with the components that you see um, on the screen there. And he piloted, and one other faculty piloted an intermediate algebra. They piloted the use of um, the materials that we created, the textbooks that had been found that were OER, and then the Math AS um, technology, or the Math AS uh, assessment system. And so the components of the system are, there's five main components that we, that we use. And actually, we're kind of going away from um, the textbook, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. But we utilize, let me go back. So for the, for the uh, materials, the students can download the um, workbooks for free and the textbooks for free, or they can do uh, print, purchase print copies in the bookstore for a nominal fee. We don't make any money off of it um, at all, but students can have access to the print version. Uh, let me go back just a minute because I want to 
I want to be sure you understand all the components. So what we've done with our OER environment is to create what we call a complete learning system. What we've tried to do is to replicate as much as possible what we would have gotten from a publisher. And so that means, you know, a, a faculty member expects to have a textbook they, in math. They expect to have an online assessment system. They expect to have um, videos and tutorials and resources for the students. And so we have created all of those things for um, all of our dev ed courses and then our other courses that utilize OER um, use primarily um, OER textbooks. So let me go back then. And in addition, I think instructors expect to have ancillary materials like an instructor manual, which uh, we learned after the first couple of semesters. And so we have created instructor manuals for all of our dev ed classes. So they have you know, solution keys and sample tests and um, activities and all kinds of things um, that the instructors can use to help them run their classes. Um, so, <coughs> <clears throat> so just to be clear on where we are with our program, we are completely open source for all of our classes from arithmetic through pre-calculus. So after that initial pilot in the spring of 12, um, we all got together and said, all right, let's do this thing. And so in the fall, uh, we only offered OER options for our classes. And you know, the instructors, we had um, 42 instructors that we trained how to work with all this. In our fall semester, we ran 65 sections that were completely OER. And since that time, through the fall of 13, we've impacted over 6,000 students with a savings of, you can see there, $655,000. And that just grows um, every semester. It's, it's wonderful. So we've really made a huge commitment in our department to open source. Our faculty have agreed to it. Even the faculty that aren't involved in the creation process um, have committed to, to using the material, mostly. Um, <laughs> I would say there's still folks that are going to do their own thing, and that's fine. You know, As long as they're not having the students buy a $150 textbook, uh, it doesn't really matter. So. Um, so our research we did was in fall 2012, and we worked with BYU to do that research. And we put together a survey, and we surveyed about um, 900, just over 900 students. And we asked them a bunch of questions about the materials, and if they liked them, if they thought they were as good as what they had before, and how much they were used to spending on textbooks and things like that. Um, we learned a lot about giving surveys through that, <laughs> through that exercise. But what I found really encouraging was that 78% um, of the students felt that the open materials supported adequately the work that they did outside of class. So there weren't any real problems you know, with what they thought about um, how the materials were helping them. And then they would recommend, 76% would recommend the materials to their classmates. So we had overwhelmingly very strong support from students. Um, how did they do in the courses? We did a you know, see or better comparison. And we compared it to fall semesters for three years. And you can see the 2012 is when we did the OER. And the numbers there are um, right in line, except for we had this weird thing going on with our 09x, which is our introductory algebra. We changed our placement testing. And so a bunch of students got placed in the 09X that should have been in arithmetic. So they were in a class that was too high for them. So that has, we're still working through the implications of all of that. But that's what happened with this number right here. Um, because you can see with the other classes that the numbers were right in line with what we had before. We asked students to talk about their experience and uh, their impressions of the materials. And they like the materials. Um, students said, I've never had an open materials class. It made the work less stressful. I didn't feel frustrated. I was able to look through my notes. Um, they like the quality, the understanding. They uh, don't like buying textbooks. They're poor. <laughs> so you know, they're pretty honest about their, uh, what they feel. That's great. 
And then going back to what I started this with is the village approach is that we really did involve um, everyone in the department that was going to be using the materials. So we had a core team that was working on writing and we had people editing. We trained all of our faculty, our adjunct faculty. We um, enlisted their help to go through and create solutions and just really involve them at every step of the way. We met with them in the in that fall semester every two weeks and we had opportunities for them to let us know what was going well, what wasn't going well. And we made changes based upon their on their feedback. So I would say that um, you know, kind of the pluses and minuses of doing a full OER effort, it's it really is a lot of development time because at the time that we realized we were doing OER, we had kind of already started down a development path. We didn't realize there was stuff kind of already out there, so we just kind of kept going that way. And so we ended up creating, you know, a full workbook for arithmetic, introductory algebra, intermediate algebra, and they're all like in their second or third edition now. Um, the maintenance and updates, you know, is time consuming. Uh, we initially had some issues with our bookstore with distribution, but that those have since been resolved in a very positive way. So that's been really good. And just uh, we were more nervous about the buy-in of our faculty than we needed to be, but I do think that that's always a concern. Um, and as far as the roses, uh, saving money for students, it's this whole project is of the things I've done in my career, and I started in math, you know, career in 1989. Uh, this is the thing I am the most proud and passionate of that I've ever done in my career because I feel like we're saving real money for students. And um, it's been a real community building effort and we've worked together as members of the department in ways that we never did before. Um, new people coming in to the effort since we've started have contributed a lot and gotten involved. Our administrative support has been critical and it's awesome. And I know that's not always the case, but we're very lucky. Um, and, and then now that we have the materials in place, we're able to have conversations about um, creative ways of working with the materials and, and how to transition someone from a traditional textbook to the, to the materials that we're using. Um, so as far as sustaining the project, because I think with OER that's the big issue is sustainability, is I think you have to have the administrative support and commitment and after about a year and a half, I finally went to my administration and I said, look, we've, we've got our point people that are working on these classes. They really need to have some release time every semester to coordinate the books and the training and the, the yada, yada, yada. And our administrator said, yep, no problem. And so we have established a, it's a two credit release um, for each of these folks that are working in those areas. And then we also realized that even though we um, want our stuff to be perfect, <laughs> as all people that produce materials do, I think. Um, we've scaled back to just doing one major revision per year on our workbooks because it contributes to our sanity. Um, and then just doing error correction and stuff on the others. So, so it's been a labor of love mostly. Um, we didn't get a lot of funding at all to do all of this stuff, but it's been a fantastic, fantastic effort. Um, so my advice, if you're going to work on um, an OER implementation that's bigger than just you and your class, is to start small, grow slowly, identify your champions, because that's got to come from within your department. It really can't come from top down, or if it does, it's received in a different way. Um, involve as many people as you can and get the support of your administration. Um, you know, gather data, look and see what's out there figure out what materials you're going to use, modify them, and then once you have something in place, just continue to grow and learn and improve with it. So um, I think that's my last slide. Oh, here's the link. If you want to see what we've done with our project materials, um, it's slightly updated for spring of 14, but the link is here, sccmath.wordpress.com, and you can go in and look at everything that you want to look at, and like I said, anything you want to have access to the Word documents, you can have them and make any changes you want. They're all either a CC BY or a CC BY SA. So um, I think that is my last slide. Yes, very good. So thank you for your time, and um, you're going to be thrilled to, to hear about Quill as a project, and then I'll take questions in the, in the chat area.
Okay. So um, first step, am I speaking loud enough uh, yes, now? Yes, Quill, that sounds great. Perfect. Okay. So um, my name is Quill West, and I am the OER Project Director at Tacoma Community College. And we have a project that we are now calling the Liberated, but it started as the Open Education Resources Project, but we needed something more exciting. And I'm going to talk specifically about how we started to grow our OER culture. And I tend to talk about our OER project, um, the work that we're doing, as if it's a garden that's growing. And I do that because I want it to feel organic and, and voluntary, but um, it's important also that planning goes into that. So I think it's possible at a college to have a series of open resource activities that are happening um, and that people are doing quietly in their offices and you don't get to know about it. And part of growing that, having a culture that's open is bringing those projects out into the light and letting people see them. So it's not about scattering love flower seeds, it's about planting an intentional garden. Um, so we start with, this is a great idea. Um, and it helps to have at TCC, our project started with the students and administrators both looking at each other and um, saying, costs are getting too high and the students saying, we want to support something that will help cut our costs. And we have a lot more um, as faculty members, we have a lot more control over our textbook costs as far as selecting them than we do over, say, tuition. So um, the students, the faculty, and the administration worked together to come up with a project that is institutionally supported, but that the students put in the grassroots money for. So um, our project is built on student money. Um, and the idea was to hire somebody, that would be me, to come to the college and um, support OER adoption, so support faculty. So we start with, hey, there's this great idea. How are we going to take care of it? How are we going to grow the seed? Um, it's always an invitation process with faculty. And you have to, um, from my perspective, we're always looking for the best place to plant the seed. So um, I'm not walking around out there just pitching stuff places. We look for the best place to nurture the seedlings. And um, early on with the OER project at TCC, we said we wanted 10 courses. We wanted 10 of our most enrolled courses across the campus curriculum. and um, I thought that that was going to be a challenge. We started with classes like English because those are gatekeeper courses for us that we know that all of our students end up taking English 101 at some point in their career. Um, and I figured, okay, we'll start with English and see what happens. The first quarter we had three different adoptions. We had a biology class, we had um, an anatomy and physiology, and we had English 101. Um, and I thought, okay, those are three for this quarter, and we're going to get to $250,000 in two years based on this work. In the second quarter, we had 10 adoptions, hands down. Faculty were just so excited to do it. So um, we found that in the first, we told our students we were going to save them $250,000 collectively in two years. By the end of the first nine months, we already met that goal. Um, so now we're a year and a half into the project keeping track of how much money we're saving students and we're at $643,000 this quarter. And we did that by being really intentional about which faculty members adopt into the project and um, giving the faculty members the choice. So not all of our English 101 classes are using open ed resources. The faculty who feel the most comfortable with them are using them. So the students have an option. Uh, and some students don't, they're not comfortable with open resources and they prefer that textbook model. And so we're leaving that there. They will always have that textbook model, but they also have the choice to save money. Um, so <laughs> we, we talk about, um, the money part, the green, is the money part, and that's one of the reasons to adopt OER. It's the flashy reason to adopt OER. It's the thing that is easily talked about. Students see it right away when they sign up for the class and when they take the class. Um, it, it's beautiful on the first day of class to say to a group of students, hey, we saved you 100 bucks in this class already, or $200, depending on the textbook. Um, 
but there's other things that we try to measure. So um, with our project, one of the things we wanted to attack early on was trying to understand how OER is affecting teaching and learning at Tacoma Community College. So we've done student surveys since the beginning of the project where we asked the students to tell us what their experience has been with OER, um, how they learned with the materials, what their practice has been, um, and then we published that data. Um, and it's, it's been overwhelmingly pretty great. We um, are our students, like 80%, would take the class again um, or would tell somebody else to take the class. So our, our success rates as far as students liking the resources are really high. Um, we have since moved to the liberated campaign concept where the students are giving us um, more narrative perspectives on what they like about their OER courses and they say things like my teachers are more, more passionate about the resources. They feel like the resources that we're using are more real life. Um, they feel like they're interacting with resources that they would interact with in their profession and they really like that. So we try constantly to be flaunting that concept of, of what there. And so that's part of listening to the students. They also will give you information. I, one of the things um, that was really important is having student feedback as we plan, not just from the students taking the classes, but from our student government um, happens to sit on our advisory committee. And it's really helpful because they tell us where they think the next thing should come. And I was a little bit worried in the first part, you know, asking these students where do you think we should go find the next class? Which teachers do you think we should talk to? Because I figured they would be saying the next class they're taking because, you know, that on a purely personal level, that's what I would want to. Um, but the students are really great about knowing um, where other, where their cohort or their colleagues are finding challenges. And so then they tell us what those are. So they say things like, well, Biology textbooks are really expensive at TCC and we've really got to work on that. Or um, they're having a big push right now in paralegal. And so they'll come to us and say, hey, we'd like to see some more development around this area. And then we can go talk to the faculty and say, you know, the student government is telling us that they're worried about these costs. Is there something we can do about it? It's still um, up to the faculty members if they feel really passionate about what they're teaching with and then we tell them, you know, make sure the students know why you're passionate about it. But we try to be um, inviting and a lot of faculty don't, they, they have wanted to transition for a long time but they didn't know they had support or they were waiting until the support was ready for them. So that's what our project does is offer the support process. Um, so we listen to the students on that. <laughs> One of the big things, and I think Donna said it really well, when you're making open resources or even adapting open resources, you want to share your stuff, but you kind of want it to be perfect before you share it. Um, and sometimes that's hard because you're using it in that time. And, and um, I, it's something that we've all had to work on, that ability to be able to say, you know what, my work's not perfect, but here's what I'm offering to the community and I would love to see what you're going to do with it. Because we've had some of our best adoptions happen by saying, here's this resource that we made. Here's our English 101 course. We made it. It's not perfect. Tell us what you think would be better so that we can adopt better resources. Uh, and that includes sharing with the faculty member who teaches across the hall. And it's the faculty member who teaches down the road and the faculty member who teaches in Phoenix. Um, it's all about letting the group see your vulnerability that your resources are not perfect and sharing them. And by doing that, we've been able to build some pretty amazing communities, including the CCC OER, so that we're able to continue to grow our ability to offer resources. Um, so <laughs> the sense of what is perfect, and that, that includes some of our assessment data. Um, you know, it's sometimes hard to release data that shows that your students lost um, achievement points. That's hard to share, but it's important to be able to say, hey, this class doesn't look perfect, so let's see what we can do to get those achievement points higher again and accept that it's all a learning process. And even if people are going to look at it, they're just going to look at it as a way to learn and grow. Um, so 
the harvesting part of this project, and this is this is a new announcement. Um, part of our project at TCC, we were built on soft money. The OER project, um, the Liberated campaign, all was built on soft money, based on the students saying, "Here's this one-time group of funding that we are going to put through to support an OER project to see what happens." It was an experiment. Um, and that money runs out on March 31st. <laughs> so it's been um, it's been a challenge trying to find an institutional way to support this process. But we just announced this week that the position, the OER position that I'm currently in, is now a sustainable position. Um, it's been mixed in with other things, but our institution has looked at it and seen the value of OER based on our trial period, our two-year process and now we're we're building that into the work regular work of our institution which is a big part of growing an intentional garden around your open resources is making sure that it fits in with the mission and vision of the institution always so um, we've been walking around for the last year saying how are we going to institutionalize Quill, which is a little bit nerve-wracking because you're thinking what kind of institution are you putting me into, but <laughs> it really means how do we make this process a part of our overall culture, how do we make it a part of what we do as an institution. So it's very exciting because that's my big open-end announcement this week. We're, we now have full-time process for this and it's a long-term thing. So um, the final thing is, if you're going to grow a tomato, um, it's great by itself, but it's even better when you put it in a salad. Uh, and when I say that, I mean it's a really great idea with open resources to tie them to other initiatives at your institution. So for example, our, um, our adult basic ed program is really, and actually all of our basic skills programs are really, really interested in contextualization. So how does OER support contextualization? How can we talk about open resources along with this concept of competency-based education? How does it fit into um, e-learning? So I'm always trying to work the OER conversation into a conversation about how we can make other initiatives at the college better. Uh, because that adds to the sustainability, but it also adds to the visibility of the project, which I think is really important when we talk about OER. So that is my last slide, and I'm more than happy to take questions because I went over the project really fast. So <laughs> please ask questions in the um, chat window. And thank you for all the congrats. <laughs> thank you, Quill. And I, I, sorry, I forgot to uh, turn on my microphone last time. Um, those were both amazing presentations. Uh, thank you, uh, Donna and Quill, and um, we're all very pleased about uh, the sustainability of your role at uh, Tacoma Community College, Quill. Thank you. I'm really excited. It's, it's right. good news. Uh, yes, it is. It is great news. Um, I see a couple questions coming in. Um, I, do you mind if I, I'm just going to go through these slides really quickly and then we'll We'll cut over to questions. Um, so here's a shameless plug for CCC OER, although I think um, everybody who's on the line um, is a member either through their state membership or district membership. Um, James and I uh, uh, are uh, on the staff, and James is the president of our advisory board. Donna is the vice president, and Quill is our um, OCW membership committee uh, representative. So <laughs> we've got the exec team here today. Um, and um, if you need help getting started, please uh, call on us. Uh, we do offer uh, workshops, sometimes face-to-face, -face, many times at conferences. Um, we do occasionally do face-to-face -face workshops uh, and come out to you. Uh, we can work on those with our members. Um, and uh, basically, uh, by joining the uh, Community College Consortium, you have access to a community of OER practitioners and experts. And uh, uh, Join us, uh, join us soon. We, um, we have webinars monthly which are focused on professional development. Of course, today we had three. Uh, in April, we uh, plan to have one on OER impact research findings. Uh, this is, uh, we've been doing OER research with the uh, Open University, but focused on community colleges. And so uh, come back in April. In May, we're going to talk about intellectual property. We also have a monthly informal meeting, which we call our advisory group meeting, which is also online. 
And um, our next meeting is uh, next Wednesday. So uh, do contact me. We'd love to have you join us. Uh, we're going to hear about one of our new members' um, OER pilot project. And back to my uh, presenters and the questions that you have. Um, you know, for the questions that are in the chat window, uh, because we, we're going to go ahead and convert this recording to a YouTube, we won't actually see all of the Q&A that occurred in the chat window because uh, it's going to strictly be uh, an audio video thing. So if there's questions that uh, Donna and uh, Quill that you answered for um, our uh, audience here and you'd like to repeat those, please, please do now. Sonia, do you want us to take those in order of them showing up? That, that the would be fine, absolutely. I mean, I can go ahead. Okay. So, uh, I was just going to say, I see one that's asking how I collect the narratives, um, the student, how we collect student narratives about how they're using OER and I uh, using multiple approach that actually I'm excited that we're going to have that webinar from on the CCC, uh, CCC OER and the OER Research Hub because I learned it from the OER Research Hub. <laughs> um, so I give the students multiple ways to share their stories. Um, we do I have a Google form that I can send that I send to faculty and say, "Would you put this in your online course if they happen to have an online course?" There's a um, some of our faculty are doing like five minute writes at the beginning of their classes, and I offer those. I sit down with students and do interviews if they want to do that. We have done video, so we have asked students to come and stand in front of a green screen and talk about um, how they feel about OER, and we'll be launching that video Friday. Um, and we do um, kind of we just have a place in the student portal where they can log in and share their information. So we're trying to collect in multiple ways. I also work with students who um, do it as a class project, as a service learning project around communication. So they go do interviews so that it's not just me and or the faculty member. So if a student wants to say something um, that they would say to a student, but they wouldn't say to an official, they can say it to another student. So we're trying to do multiple ways of getting those student narratives because we're trying to get it the best information we can. Thank you, Quill. And so the green screens that you're going you're gonna to use, uh, is that with students and faculty you're going to try and get uh, videos? Yeah, so we just finished a student video, um, an edited student video, and faculty come next. So um, that's part of the Liberated campaign. We're doing a series called We Are Liberated, where the students get a chance to talk about what it means to them to have OER in their lives. Um, and then we're going to have the faculty do the same thing. Great, great. And there, um, I know that Kaleidoscope did um, a, student, a student benefits video, which featured faculty. Um, and I. I just saw it this week. I don't have the link handy. If you have the link handy, you might want to put that in the chat window. I thought that was quite a powerful video. And uh, you were one of the featured stars on there. Do you know the video I'm talking about? I was. I will look it up. Yeah, I do. And I will look it up. Um, and I think, and that one was OER Leaders, so which is really, really cool. But I'm trying to get the faculty who um, just quietly you really are in their classrooms <laughs> to talk about what it means in their teaching and learning too because I think their voice is sometimes not heard um, because they're just trying to teach their right, classes. Right. Yeah. There, there was at least one faculty member on there, but you're right, it was primarily uh, more of the leaders. Um, let's see, Donna, what were some of the questions that you, you answered in the chat window that you'd like to repeat? Uh, well, Karen had asked um, what were some of the negatives that students talked about in the survey, and um, I was trying to remember, but I think that it was our first rollout and it was our first edition of all of our materials, and so you know they were commenting on some of the mistakes in the materials, and um, 
And they also indicated that they wanted more of certain kinds of resources and more of certain kinds of problems or videos or whatever. And so we took a lot of that um, feedback and were able to incorporate that into our second and third versions of the materials that we're using. So, um, so it was good. Yeah, thank you, Donna. And so you provide a, a lot of different sort of modalities for students, right? Um, you were using right. the live tribe pen, and um, do you want to talk about some of that and, and some of the videos that you use um, in your? Yes. So for our demo courses, uh, we primarily teach the courses using our interactive workbooks. And each of our interactive workbooks has about 150 videos that we've created that go with the workbook lockstep. And so we've, we've really advocate a flipped model in our classes where students are responsible for watching the videos outside the classroom and kind of preparing themselves to um, be active when they come to class, having exposed themselves to this material. So that's why we've really gone away from even offering the, the OER textbooks um, because we just don't use them. We, we've beefed up the workbooks to the point where that, those really are our textbooks. And so students watch the videos, they work through the workbooks, they work problems in the assessment system uh, in Math AS. And then what's nice is that the materials will support the teaching style of, of any of our faculty. So if you have a more traditional faculty member that doesn't want to use the online assessment system, doesn't want to use the videos, they can use the interactive workbook and they can walk through and lecture over the examples that are in the workbook and have the students fill them out during class. So we do have folks that do that. So the workbooks can be completely standalone. Um, I, of course, feel they're greatly enhanced by using the online assessment system, but we have faculty that choose not to use that. Um, but then we have faculty that use, use all of those pieces. So, so that's what I was referring to when I said we really created a full learning system is we have as many resources as the students or the faculty could want um, to access. Um, to be successful. So. Thank you, Donna. And, and that, I guess that's, I think, a really important piece, too, is that, um, you know, not dictating to faculty as you roll out a department-wide kind of OER effort, not dictating to faculty how, how you use it um, and allowing that kind of flexibility. Um, it, it, it's far more successful <laughs> right. than right. dictating. Yeah, that's really great. Um, I, I thought this was an interesting question that Jen posted for Quill. Uh, she said, how do you encourage the, that culture of vulnerability, ongoing learning with faculty as they create OER materials? And I, I'm not going to answer this for Quill, but I would say you have to meet Quill. She's a, she's a <laughs> I, I, I think if you meet Quill, you'll, you'll, you'll understand that she could do that. But um, Quill, I, I'd like to let you answer that one. Thanks, Una. That's funny. Um, um, so that is a wonderful question, and I was sitting here trying to decide how to answer it. And I, I think there's a, several things you can do. And, and the first thing is putting a friendly face on. Let's just see what happens, um, which some faculty really embrace and go with. I think the other thing is building a community of of faculty who. Um, they, they know they're looking at each other's resources and then they're supporting each other and that's so kind of that community of practice experience is really important. Um, I'm lucky enough to work at an institution where we have an expert, Jill Monroe, on learning communities. So I've been able to learn from her how to foster a community of, of a partnership kind of a situation. Um, and then building that com partnership to be bigger than the faculty that are in somebody's own department. Because sometimes um, it doesn't feel like that's enough of a peer review, even though that's a pretty extensive peer review and sometimes the best one that you can get. Um, so I lean heavily on my partnerships in the open world to say, hey, we have um, something in speech communication. Who else is working in that area? Um, so I often reach out to the faculty who were on the Open Course Library and ask them to look at new resources that others have created. Um, I go to others in the state who I know are interested in open resources and I say, hey, um, can you take a look at this for a faculty member? And then I try to build that relationship up so that the faculty um, 
feel confident that at least they've had a peer review look at their work. And some, it's still not perfect, but at least it's a little more confidence building. Great. Thank you. Um, so um, it looks like we've run out of questions. Um, do we have any closing comments by our uh, panelists or, or our audience <laughs> before we uh, close? Well, um, we do want to thank you all for coming, um, and um, we look forward to seeing you um, at one of our upcoming community college uh, meetings online or in person at a conference, because um, we do attend a, a number of conferences, and, and we'd love to see you there. So thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm going to turn off the recorder then, and um, we'll see you soon. And thanks, Donna and Quill. <laughs>